Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we hear from Scripture this morning. Our first reading is from the letter Paul wrote to the Ephesians, starting in chapter 6. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And our gospel reading comes from the gospel of Luke in chapter 18. Now they were bringing even infants to him, that being Jesus, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called to them, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Father, I thank you that you have gathered us this morning. We've already been able to celebrate that you have welcomed William into your kingdom through the waters of baptism. Lord, I pray that you stir our hearts and imaginations of how you are inviting us into your kingdom and, and through the example of children, we can learn what that looks like. Holy Spirit, I pray with humility that you speak uh, through me clearly, Lord, that my words are guided by you, and that you create um, good soil in the hearts and minds of my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe seated. Good morning. Can I get, uh, oh, good, yeah. Can I get the house lights up? I want to really see people this morning as I preach. Awesome. Well, if I haven't met you, I'm Pastor Anthony. It's so good to be with you this morning. Um, I became a Christian at 16 years old. And the good people of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Agora Hills, California, um, when I became a Christian, I was like, what do I do now? And they said, well, now that you're a Christian, you need to learn how to read your Bible, learn how to pray. When you make some money, give 10% of it back to the church. And since I was 16, and a boy, they said, and whatever you do, like they over but whatever you do, do not have sex before you're married. Whatever you do, like that's what they emphasize the most out of everything. I was like, all right, I'm scared of girls now, okay. So I uh, continue to follow Jesus, and I learn how to read my Bible. I learn how to pray. I start making some money and start tithing, and I just, until I magically met my wife, just never looked at a girl ever again. And uh, I follow that journey for 20, or until I'm in my late, late 20s, early 30s. At this point, um, I'm married, so that last thing they emphasize, I'm like, all right, we're good there. Um, I've gone to seminary, I'm a pastor, I learned how to read the Bible well enough. We're like, good, go. Um, at that point, my wife and I, like, we, we were tithing more than 10% to our local church. I'm like, huh, I guess I've arrived at following Jesus. And I had this pit in my soul, of, like, surely there has to be more to following Jesus. Jesus. And at that point, I realized I'd never been discipled. I came to faith a little later in, in uh, my youth, and, and I had never had someone intentionally that was farther along and following Jesus say, come follow me as I follow Christ. Come, let me teach you what it means to follow this rabbi. And uh, the sad thing was, I had been to seminary, I had uh, read all the books on discipleship, I had been to all the conferences on discipleship. I even preached some really good sermons about discipleship, but I realized I had never been discipled. So by God's grace, I meet this other pastor in the DFW area, John David, and um, he's kind of like the discipleship guy up there when he lived there. Now he's in Iowa, pray for him. And... Uh, I was, if you're from Iowa, I'm sorry if that was offensive to you. But uh, I, so I started meeting with him and I said, hey, will you disciple me? He's like, yeah. And then another young pastor came along. That was like kind of our network of pastors. And for two years, we met every single week for two hours. And we would read the scriptures together. We would pray. We would talk about life, about pastoring, being um, uh, uh, husbands. The other guy had a kid. And, um, and every week he would basically boil it down to what is Jesus saying to you and what are you going to do about it? And over the course of those two years, my faith in Jesus took a whole new level 
of, of fruit bearing, if you will, in the words of the New Testament, where my life, my faith started to come to life and really impact all areas of my life, not just my quote unquote spiritual life. And I had developed at that time, I started to um, dive into the ancient spiritual writers, the early mother, or desert and uh, the desert mothers and fathers, these people who went out to the, the de- desert around the 300s to learn to follow Jesus as the church kind of became popular in Rome. And um, started to learn about the spiritual disciplines, uh, prayer, contemplative prayer, silence and solitude, fasting, all these things. If you've been around since I got here, a lot of things that I've kind of helped walk us through at times. And my life was beautiful. I'd wake up every single morning and spend a leisurely hour, hour and a half praying and reading the scriptures and sitting in silence with Jesus. And then September 6, 2020, around 4 p.m., this guy crashes into my world and ruins everything. This is my boy Soren. He was eight days old, giving me the stink eye, saying, you have no idea what you're in for, buddy. He's now four years old, and he is the joy of my life. But parenting is by far the hardest thing I have ever done. You think you know. We were older. We were 35 when he was born. I'm like, all my friends have kids. Like, how hard could this really be, right? And oh yeah, it was awful. It was so, and it was 2020, so we were by ourselves. Like family couldn't come visit. People from church couldn't come visit. We were locked down by ourselves. And I know parenting has always been hard, but um, I like, especially in this service, have fun with it. I'm a millennial, so boomers think we're just butterflies and complain about everything. Well, you raised us, so there you go. But I just did, uh, there was a study showing that parenting is, I know parenting's always been hard, but Statistically, it's the most stressful it's ever been in modern society right now for young parents. And the two main reasons are um, just the cost of living in this country is so expensive now. It's causing young families just extraordinary amount of stress. And the fact that we're so individualized and lack of community, that we don't have the quote-unquote village around us that many generations before us had. But parenting has always been hard. But the hardest thing for me was when when this little guy crashed into my world, all of these spiritual disciplines I had developed over the last two years went out the window. When he was born, the little flap in your esophagus wasn't developed, so he just spit up like the exorcist kid all the time. He was colicky. He did not sleep. Like He slept at night, but he would not nap. He basically was like that all the time, like, I'm watching you, right? Like, a nap would be like 15 minutes, and we're like, praise Jesus, right? And I started to feel guilty and shameful because I didn't have my morning routine anymore with Jesus of praying and reading the scriptures. I'd be praying, and then i hear, wah, wah, wah. I'm like, don't you know I'm trying to love Jesus, so I can go back to sleep, right? I would get up and go get him, right? But in the moment, I thought that was a very unspiritual thing because I, I kind of narrowed what this formation had looked like. Now, this, this is supposed to be the parenting sermon, right? When I saw my list, uh, my name next to the preaching schedule of, on parenting and changing diapers, I was like, Martin, why me? Like, I have one kid and he's four. You have a plethora and they are much older than, than my child. And you, you, I come to you for parenting advice, right? Even Amanda, our children's director, she's like, you're preaching today? I'm like, thanks for the vote of confidence, Amanda. Amanda, you're new here still, so watch it. And uh, I'm going, huh. And part of me, like, I'm not super fond of, like, one-off sermons. In, in, like, the Western suburban church, there's, like, kind of four sermons, five sermons we're supposed to preach. You have your New Year's sermon, like, it's a new year, new you, like, follow Jesus better, like, pep talk. In the fall, there's a vision and mission sermon, like, here's the vision your pastor's been given from the Lord, now follow us, Right? Kind of like a a CEO would explain the vision to the company. And then there's the the giving sermon, like, "Uh, guys, and you're like, when the the generosity sermon comes, like, can we just talk about politics? Like, that'd be a lot less awkward than my pocketbook, please, right? And then especially in the suburbs, the parenting sermon, right? Um, My last church, I preached a whole parenting sermon series before I even had a kid. Yeah, God, uh, that, I hope that's 
church is okay from that, right? But there's spiritual aspects. There's, there's wisdom from the scriptures I could pull out, but it's a one-off. Like, it's not going to do much. Honestly, there's way better uh, certified, credentialed people writing books and write, uh, recording podcasts on parenting from a biblical Christian worldview that will be much more hopeful. Like, that back of the sanctuary right now, there are like 1,700 children and three adults back there right now. Like, go listen to the, go, you guys over there, listen to those podcasts, read those books, because I don't have all the answers. So this morning, I want to do something different. But to set that up, I came across this story in a book called The um, Domestic Monastery. And there's a story of this man, Carl Coletto, and he was a, a Catholic priest, and he went and lived in the Sahara Desert for an extended period of time to escape the trappings of the world, to become more like Jesus, to fast and to pray and to spend time with Jesus in solitude. And then he was Italian, he goes back to Italy, and he sees uh, his mother, who had been raising young children for the better part of 30 years, and he confesses that he quickly realized his mother was far more like Jesus, far more contemplative, far less selfish than he was because she had spent her life raising small children. The author of the book upon that story says, if that is true, and Coretto suggests that it is, the conclusion we should draw is not that there was anything wrong with his long hours of solitude in the desert, there is something very right about the years his mother lived and interrupted life amid the noise and demands of small children. Huh. This morning, I want us to pause and think, because sometimes the traditional parenting sermon makes me a bit uncomfortable, because we have many people in our congregation, not that every sermon has to hit everyone the same, but many people that They've desired to have children, and they aren't able to. And it's a, it's a tender spot to talk about. There's some people that just, they don't want to have kids. Maybe God's called them to singleness. There's teenagers and young adults in here who like, I, what? I'm not uh, children, you know. There's some of us that, that you've lost a child, What do we do with that in your typical parenting sermon? But what I want to do this morning, if you don't have children, as I'm talking for the next couple minutes, substitute child with any other relationship in your life that requires extra effort, that is demanding of you, that takes your time and your energy and your resources. Maybe it's an aging parent Maybe it's, a, it's a, another family member. Maybe it's that coworker who acts like a teenager. <laughs> that you have to go love tomorrow as you step into the office. But how do these relationships, instead of, instead of us trying to assert our power and change them, how may the Holy Spirit use them to actually form us to be a different kind of people? Our gospel reading was from Luke. Let me read it for us again. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to himself saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for so such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This teaching from Jesus would have been jaw-dropping to his audience. Jesus was gaining a reputation for himself. He was an important guy. His disciples were like, we are not going to let these infants bother him. In Jesus' time, they did not worship children like we do in our culture. They were the bottom in the social class. They were a nuisance. If anything, they were kind of property that would just be used for whatever you needed to be done around the home. And Jesus is flipping the kingdom, uh, the worldly kingdom on its head and saying, no, actually, if you want to receive God's kingdom, God's reign and rule, you need to become like one of these. As I've been thinking and meditating on this passage, I wonder not only maybe we need to take that posture on more of a child, but do the children in our lives, the people in our lives that require more time and energy and resources, perhaps they are being used by the Spirit to actually form us to become the kind of people that can receive the kingdom. As I've been thinking about 
the kingdom and, and the children. And, and my mom was going to Matthew 5, and Jesus does this, has this sermon on the mount where, where he, it's, his, it's his kingdom manifesto. If you want to live in my kingdom, be a citizen of heaven, this is what it looks like. This is how you live out the kingdom ethic. And he opens it in Matthew 5 with the Beatitudes. And, and he opened his mouth. And Jesus taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. If you have a small child, you feel that every day. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. Again, I feel like that every time I come home. You and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is saying, if you want to receive the kingdom, you have to become this kind of person. So the question is, how do we become that kind of person? Now the good news is that actually it's nothing you can muster up. A scholar I was reading on this is when Jesus is saying blessed it is, he's actually saying, I'm going to make you this kind of person. It's the spirit working in our life. The spiritual disciplines are just a trellis for the spirit to then bear fruit in our life lives. But what if, I've been thinking through this, the children in our lives that we're called to care for, the people in our lives that require extra attention, what if instead of us thinking again that it's something we need to master and oversight our power and authority, what if God's inviting us to submit ourselves to the simple task of changing a diaper over and over, of caring for someone that can't care for themselves, for dealing with the emotions of a teenager in puberty that has no idea what's happening to their body in that moment. What if in those moments, God is using them to form us to be people who are peacemakers and people who are merciful and people who are meek and pure in heart. This all sounds way more romantic than it actually is. Like I've been writing this sermon for like a week and a half now and every morning I'm praying before Soren does get up because we're kind of back in that stage now where I can do that. I'm like, Lord, help me be patient Use my little dude to form me. And like, then he wakes up and that all goes out the window. I'm like, "Ah, eat what I made you for breakfast. Like, come on, let's go to school. Like, it's just, it seems, Pastor Martin, as he wrote the, you'll see the write-up online is like, parenting feels like death by a thousand paper cuts. Yeah, it does. (laughs) Last night I sat on the, like Saturday was just a rough day where like Soren was not listening to me and He's got a, a beautiful, individualistic, like hard-headedness, just like his mother. And watching the two of them go at it is hilarious, and it ends well for nobody. And I get on the couch last night, and I'm just like, I'm a failure. I'm like the worst parent ever. Because I can't even live up to my own ideal. But what if even that, at that point, God's saying, show yourself some grace, man. But other passage is from Ephesians. And what Paul is doing here with this commandment, we'll see in a minute, of, of children obey or honor your parents. Paul's doing some, some brilliant missionary work here. So Paul is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. It's a bunch of new Christians. And it's a culture that is very much hostile against the way of Jesus. And at the end of his letter, he starts um, critiquing what the Romans had called uh, uh, household codes. Kind of like in their society, this is like the ideal for the household in there in the Roman Empire. And Paul is, uh, he's going through them. If you go read it, he's talking about husbands and wives, servants and masters, 
children and parents. And he, he affirms what is good and true and beautiful in that culture, but then tweaks it just enough to show how Jesus actually is calling Christians to live a different, more beautiful way. And he starts off, children, obey, or, uh, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Then he goes on to quote from, Deut- uh, from uh, the, the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it, may well, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Even the Romans who were not um, well-versed in Jewish law would have been like, yeah, parents or children, obey your parents. Like most of us here are like, yeah, children, obey your parents. That is good and true, right? And there's a lot of other nuance we can get in there of obey versus honor and all that stuff. That's not the point for this morning. But then this is where he tweaks it. He flips it on his head. He says, but fathers... Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's when they would have gone, huh? What do you mean? Like, my children are my property. I can do whatever I want. I'm the head honcho. I'm in charge here. And Paul is critiquing their way and offering something better. Some of you hear discipline. Yeah, it's actually more teaching. An instruction of the Lord. I'm not going to get into what that looks like and the tips and tricks about what that looks like, but what Paul is doing here is he's showing this community, he's calling this community of Christians who are living in hostile culture, saying, this, I, I'm, I'm calling you out to live life in a more beautiful way, in a way that when the culture around you sees, uh, is hostile towards this movement called the way, when they see you living life differently in this way that's actually more beautiful, that brings out the dignity of all humans, even small children, they're going to begin to ask questions. They're going to begin to see that you actually are living life in a way that is, that, that is inviting life, not power and control. This upside-down kingdom. And perhaps that would, that's what Jesus is trying to do in us, is not only for our own formation, but to form us in a way that is beautiful to the world watching around us. When they see our lives, they actually go, that's actually good news. That's something I want to be part of. How does God do that? Through mundane, ordinary tasks such as changing diapers caring for the people that take extra efforts. So this may be the worst parenting sermon ever, <laughs> but it's not about parenting. It's about letting the Spirit use those things in our life to form us more and more into people of love. Scripture say, God is love. And Christ, through the Spirit, is forming us to be more like God, which is actually to become people of love. And that's the end goal And love attracts people to itself. So my prayer for us this week, two things. First, we have a lot of young families right here in this this service. Show yourself some grace. If you have a small young family, like your pastors don't expect you to sign up for the two hours, six month Bible study. It's okay. The act of changing diapers is just as formational as spending an hour in the Word. And for the rest of us, I don't know what your week holds. I don't know what those relationships look like. But I guarantee you some of them are messy and difficult because we're human. And what if this week as you head into to work this week or class or whatever it may be, instead of trying to assert your power actually allow the Spirit to let you submit to those things to form you and change you day in and day out over the course of a lifetime. And as the people who don't yet follow Jesus, may they see the light shining in you that we just saw at the baptism, that they may follow that light to the one who saved us and redeemed us and continues to make us new. Let us pray. Father, as... um, We try to faithfully follow your way, Lord. We rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. I pray for the many young families in this congregation. Lord, I pray that um, 
they see every moment holy. I pray, Lord, for the older saints here, that they come around these younger families and mentor and encourage and disciple and walk with. Help our church become cross-generational, Lord. Lord, I pray for those hearing this that have the tender wound of not being able to have children. Lord, bring your peace to them and help them see how they can still play that role of a spiritual parent. Lord, I pray for those who have lost their children. Bring your peace to them, Lord. But Lord, above all, we ask that you give us, you increase our faith to trust you and to even submit to the mundane tasks of changing diapers. Come Holy Spirit. Amen.